I'm Fiona McEnena from Fair Play for Women. I think you know that Fair Play for Women was the first to raise the alarm back in 2017 about the prisons problem. I did not do that. I'll pass that clap back to Nicola. Oh, it doesn't sound right, does it? I'll pass that applause back to Nicola Williams. So that, that was her on GMB. Um, and then, um, of course, you know, we moved on. We worked in other areas. We um, have been battling away with the media and crime reporting, trying to get them to stop accusing women of men's crimes. We took the ONS to court. We did GRA, mobilized for GRA reform. Just so you know what's coming, we've, we've got three separate panels. So first, we're going to hear from our superstars, our elite sportswomen. Then we're going to talk a bit more about some of the big stories that have peaked, peaked people um, in sport and more generally. So we're going to have a bit of a focus on cycling and then a bit of a focus on swimming in the USA. Um, and you will know why, I think. Um, so, and then at the very end, I'm going to come back and say, uh, you can help, and here's how you can help, and we'll just have a brief discussion about that. I want to say thank you to everyone who's put comments in the Hoover app, who's participated in the poll. One of the issues in this field is it's, it's quite hidden. People think it's not really happening because we're not allowed to talk about it and because no one's allowed to say. So it's really important that we can hear from people and hear stories and anecdotes so that we can say it is happening and it is affecting women and girls. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, so let's meet our panel. So, um, as our um, host for the next little section, we've got Tonya Antoniazzi, Member of Parliament. Come on, Tonya. So Tonya, yep, Tonya's the MP, the Labour MP for Gower, and before she got into politics, she was a teacher, um, and she came into Parliament five years ago, and she also played rugby for Wales. And uh, next we've got Mara Yamauchi who is the UK's... third fastest marathon runner ever. Um, she's a... She's a... She's a two-time Olympian, so she's been to two Olympic Games. She's runner-up at the London Marathon. Medals here, there, and everywhere. Um, and um, she was a diplomat in the Foreign Office for 10 years before she became a full-time athlete. Yeah, so two careers. Thing, one more thing about Mara for you to know is that her first book is out. It's called Marathon Wisdom. And we also have Sharon Davis, MBE. So you know Sharon. So Sharon first rode in the Olympic Games when she was 13. Yeah, so imagine how hard she worked for eight years to get to the Olympics at 13. And she'll tell you a bit more about her experience when she won her Olympic silver against, uh, beaten by a German who was doping, and she'll tell you about that. You know about that. Um, Sharon has a book coming out. It is an honour to be on the stage with these two legends, and I, I love it when I'm classed as an elite athlete as well. <clears throat> There's a hashtag in there. But I think it's really important that, you know, I've been in Parliament for the last five years. Uh, you know, the reason why I'm sitting on this stage now is something I want to share with you, and, and so does, you know, so does Sharon, and so does Mara. And that is really, really important for us because we are, have been impacted by the, the, the negative press about what we are saying. <clears throat> I am a Labour politician. I would like to thank Labour Women's Declaration for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to talk openly and with colleagues and with people about my concerns about sex-based rights in sport. 
So I'd like to thank them for it. And I would like to also tell you, on behalf of my colleagues in the PLP, we are there, we are with you. Do not give up on Labour. We are working together for the betterment of women. <coughs> I did play rugby for Wales and being a woman is very important for me. I had a brother that played rugby for Wales, under 18s and under 21s. I grew up in his shadow, the handsome, the, the popular and the, you know, dynamic brother that I had. Uh, I have, still have. <laughs> Bless him. But if, I'd have been, if I had have been subject to the social media influences that are out there today, I don't know where I would be today because... I didn't, and I, I had to learn to love myself, to go through a difficult puberty, and that is what is really important. We have to be proud of ourselves as women, and it's that journey that I want my, you know, my friends here to share with you why we are here. I am here because I am a legislator. It is my responsibility to ask those difficult questions, to get people to talk, and for us to be able to have a civil conversation that isn't based on attacking each other on Twitter or on social media. It is important that we have these open conversations and we work at what the impact of legislation and of policy making, which doesn't fall in line with legislation, has on young women and girls in sport and all sports at all levels, especially grassroots. So I'm going to pass over and I just want to ask a question. I'm going to go over to Mara to ask Mara, why are you here Mara? Why are you on this stage with, with, with us today? Thanks very much Tonya and thank you very much to Philia for, for hosting this session and to Fair Play for Women. Well, I'm, I'm a former athlete. Um, I was a not, nothing special sort of junior athlete uh, and then it took me 24 years uh, from when I had a dream to become an elite athlete at age 11 to standing on the start line of an Olympic Games in 2008 in Beijing. And, you know, 24 years is a quarter of a century. It's a long time. And there were lots of ups and downs along the way. And, you know, I, I, I love women's sport. I benefited from women's sport being for females only all that time. And it absolutely breaks my heart to see males being allowed to compete in female sport now. Um, um, but, but I came very late to elite sport. Um, I was 35 when I competed in the Beijing Olympics. When I was younger, I had a multi-sport uh, childhood. I was predominantly a swimmer, like Sharon, for several years. Um, so I was horrified to see the Oxford City Council saying that all of its facilities, including the ferry pool where I trained many times a week for years, must now be gender neutral. Um, so swimming, hockey, obviously hockey, you know, the potential for injuries in hockey is massive, netball. So I came from lots of other sports and I really only specialised in distance running from age 18. And then it... I worked, as Tonya said, as a civil servant for um, 10 years. For three years, I worked part-time and trained part-time so that I could reach elite level and then earn a living uh, as an athlete. Um, so the state of women's sport now and you know, all these NGBs saying, yes, males can compete in women's sport, it's, it's completely bonkers to me. I, I just don't know how we're in this situation. And I, I sometimes say on Twitter, you know, it's destroying women's sport. And people say, why do you use such strong language? But the fact of the matter is now in the UK, boxing, as my, is my understanding, is the only sport in which the women's category is for females only. To my knowledge, there is no other policy anywhere which says female sport is for females only. So all the other sports allow males into the female category. So it's fair to say that women's sport, apart from boxing, does not exist. This is not an exaggeration. Yes, in practice, you know, most female competitions will be females present there, but actually there is no sport apart from boxing in which a woman or girl can go and participate in a competition and be guaranteed that a male will not show up and they, they will have to compete against them. Um, during my career, 
so elite sport is seen as very sort of glamorous and it all looks very easy, but believe me, it really isn't like that. It's, it's, it's really, really tough. And I, when I look back at my career, I, I see it as a series of flaming hoops that I had to leap through. So to give you some examples, the way I earned my first GB vest in cross country was as follows. I was at a trial race, so a cross country race, and they took the first three across the line. Um, I was below third for, for the entirety of the race, but literally on the line, I pipped one other athlete and got into third place. So I was picked for the team and she wasn't. Obviously, she was quite pissed off. Um, but, you know, I got there by the absolute skin of my teeth. Then in 2004, I tried to qualify for the Athens Olympics, but I failed. But I thought, I know I can do better than this. I'll, I'll persevere. A year later, I qualified for my first GB vest in the marathon by eight seconds. So it's, and then before the Beijing Olympics, where I finished six, which is still the best performance ever by, joint best performance ever by a British woman in the Olympic marathon. I, to, just before that, I had a terrible foot pain and I thought I had a stress fracture in my foot and wouldn't be able to compete. But thankfully, I was able to compete, but I had to have several days completely off running. Before the Osaka World Championships in 2007, I got the flu two weeks before, so I, I nearly was unable to compete and finish, finish ninth in that race. Um, so it's, it's really, really tough. And of course, earning, an, earning a living as an athlete is really tough. In 2011, um, I was unable to compete in the London Marathon uh, because of injury. And as a marathon runner, you can really only compete sort of two to three times a year at, at, you know, at your best. So that was a massive chunk of my income foregone, just like that, because of injury. You know, in all those scenarios where I got onto teams by the skin of my teeth, if a male had been in that race, I wouldn't have been on the team. I wouldn't have had that confidence. I wouldn't have had the experience of going to a GB, you know, a competition with a British vest. And, you know, that, that builds your confidence to the point where, you know, you can actually perform at a good level. In that very first competition, I was 38th in the European Championships, which is frankly nothing special. But over the, a period of time, I eventually got up to 6th at the Olympics. Um, and so, those places are really important. Yeah. You know, to be pushed out yeah. by one would have made a big mm. difference. We, we often hear people say, well, trans women aren't winning, therefore it's okay. You know, it's, it's often couched about who's winning. But sport isn't just about winning. You know, when you go to the Olympics, getting into the semi-finals in athletics is a big deal. Just getting out of your heats is a big deal. If you get to the final of the yeah. Olympics, you are treated like a god or goddess in your... You know, never mind winning. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to steal Kim's, Kim's thunder later, but Leah Thomas's performances, you know, she pushed females out of... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've got into that bit of saying she just so I don't get kicked off Twitter, but yeah. <laughs> Leah Thomas you know, prevented females from reaching the A finals, the B finals, the C finals in all these different competitions. So it's not just about winning. Yeah, okay, thank you, Mara. <laughs> I think that ties in really well then to, to, to ask Sharon why, you know, we know about your journey, we know what you've been saying, but why is it so important to keep female sport female? Women's sport was created for females. That's why it was created. You know, we used to have only men's sports. You know, the Olympics, the first Olympics was only men's sport. We've had only men's sport for years. I think it was 1970 when they brought the marathons in, you know. 84. 84 the first was the first was in marathon 1984. for women. How disgusting is that, okay? So it's taken us 84 years of Olympics to get a marathon in the Olympic Games, and now they want to take that opportunity away from us. No. No. Uh, can, can I just add something? Uh, so World Athletics are reviewing their trans inclusion policy at their meeting in November. And after that, UK Athletics will be issuing a new policy. Uh, I don't know what's going to be in it, but please watch closely because, you know, if they allow males into female athletics, we could see males in the Olympic marathon. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, and, and so my point has always been, my history, as you, you know, because many of you have heard me speak before and, and certainly follow me on Twitter, my passion comes from years of racing East Germans. And the East Germans were pump, pumped full of testosterone through no choice of their own. They were very much a victim of the, the Soviet dominance, the Iron Curtain and the GDR. And these young girls were put on testosterone as young as 11 and 12 years old. And in lots of instances, absolutely wrecked their lives. Um, but it gave them male puberty, which enabled them to absolutely dominate the world of swimming. And they had nowhere near the advantage that males have over females. They had this female, they had the addition of testosterone, but it didn't give them the difference that males have. It still only gave them a percentage of that. And they absolutely dominated. And Tan mentioned the book. I'm doing a book which is called Unfair Play, which will be out next year. And it's all about the challenges to women's sport across everything. And it's it's made me so angry because I've been doing it for the last month and obviously it's digging up a lot of old stuff that, you know, I've kind of put to bed. I know it's all there, but I've, I've let it rest a little bit. And I found out only yesterday from the, from the guy that I'm writing the book with, um, who writes for the Times, Craig Lord, that the Stasi, which was the East German um, police, basically, they had a clinic built, an abortion clinic built for the young girls, because they gave them testosterone, which meant that they had an increased sex drive. Many of them got pregnant because they didn't have any form of protection. And so they put them through these, through these abortion clinics so that they could be good at sport. I mean, it's extraordinary what, was, what went on. And all of this was ignored by the IOC for 20 years. They had East Germans defecting, taking the risk of getting out of East Germany where they would have been shot if they'd been caught so that they could report back to the IOC with the little blue pills and, and the, you know, the, the documentations, with everything to try and show them what was being done to them. And the IOC still did nothing. The IOC are not an establishment to hold up as an example of how to run sport. They really are not. So this has made me so angry that this was allowed to happen and a whole generation of young females lost their opportunity to win medals. I won medals behind East Germans. All of my medals were behind East Germans. I would have been the youngest person to ever win a European gold medal at 14 had it not been for two East Germans that were in front of me. I would have been an Olympic gold medalist had there not been an East German in front of me. You know, in every single medal that I've ever won, there was an East German in front of me who was on drugs. And I know how it feels to be cheated out of medals when you can do nothing about it. No matter how hard I train, six hours a day to my sport, I could not bridge the gap that those drugs were giving, the benefit those drugs were giving that girl. And I don't want that to happen to another generation of young females. So that is why I speak out very loudly. And that really resonates with so many of us that watched you, you know, it, it, growing up as children. You were such an icon and, and you were absolutely shat on. Yeah, you know? from a great high. And, and nothing was done about it. You know, that's the thing. And I know that nothing will be done about this. So we don't need, you know, what, what, what we found is that we need the Leah Thomases of this world for everyone to go, oh, look, there's Leah Thomas winning the women's events. Oh, look, there's six foot three Leah Thomas, actually much stronger, much bigger, gone from 600th in the men's to being first in the women's. Oh, what a surprise. It's not a surprise. Everybody knows it's not a surprise. Why are we having to have Leah Thomases before we step back and go, there is a difference between male and female biology? You know, this is just crazy. Oh, and we are lucky. I mean, the Sports Council Equality Guidance Report that came out did prove that there was, it, it was irreconcilable. Absolutely. You can't have full equality, unfortunately. Where as much as I want to, to be able to say, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? You're completely humanly, bio biologically different. You know, it, we're just not the same. And, I, and, and I it's really not that they're better. We are just different. You know, that's the whole point. It's about being just different and being both being great in our, in our own areas. You know, I look at, I have arguments all the time with my son about men and women's football, okay? Men are paid ludicrous amounts of money, £300,000, you know, per week to go and play football for a team. The girls are lucky if they get 10 grand a year, right? Absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The girls don't throw themselves on the floor and pretend that they were kicked yeah. either. <laughs> Go on, Mara. Uh, on, on the biology point, I just want to make an observation. So all these policies which allow males into the female category define eligibility for the female category on levels of testosterone. And you, see, you never see mention 
in the policies, and you hardly ever see mentioned in the debate, about everything to do with having a female body which affects sports performance. Menstruation, yeah. pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, abortion, endometriosis, all these things. You know, this is what female athletes have to cope with and manage and be good athletes at the same time. You know, and <laughs> so... The fact that eligibility for the female category is defined by the, uh, the essence of maleness, which is testosterone, is just completely incomprehensible to me. And y yes, testosterone affects performance, but we all know that what makes males physically stronger, faster, etc., than females is male puberty over several yeah. years, not circulating levels of testosterone in an adult male. And, you know, it's very clear that all those things I mentioned affect performance. So, for example, any female athlete who wants to have a child, that means probably, you know, 12 months plus being unable to compete at a high level. That means foregone income, you know, you, it's, it's effectively time out of your career. And no male will ever have to spend any money, energy, physical or mental, time, managing and dealing with these things. So to say that, you know, the only difference between males and females is the level of testosterone in an in a adult male is... I can't even put into words how ludicrous it is. But also, all the science is out there. Yeah. You know, it's not like... We have 16 peer-reviewed studies in the world, and not a single one of them shows that you can mitigate male puberty advantage. And the last one, which came out from Brazil, what, a couple of weeks ago? That was actually on transgender women after 14 years, and still they remained with 20% better strength and CO2 advantage. So uh, their cardiovascular system, CV system. That's after 14 years. And all the documentation we have out of East Germany, again, shows that once you've given testosterone to these young girls, even if you remove it, the benefits that they've got will never go. Yeah. So once a male has gone through male puberty, there is no way that they should ever be in a, in a women's event. And I, I do need to give a little bit of a clap on the back to, to British Triathlon, because they have been amazing, okay? British Triathlon actually are another one of the organizations which have been incredibly strong and say, we will protect sport for, for females as well as boxing. FINA, incredibly proud, although it did take them a little while, but FINA, world swimming, you know, they were the first to come along and go, we will protect women's sport. And I am hoping, so hoping, that athletics are brave too, and Sabat Seb is brave, and we need to put a lot of pressure on Seb to do the right thing yeah. um, to protect women's athletics. On that, on that point as well, I mean, I, I'd like to, you know, a lot of the reasons why I, I, I get involved is around safety and concussion. Absolutely. And, and particularly in contact sport, and I'd like to say a, a big well done to the RFU and the WRU for falling into line with world rugby. I think it needs... We just... And, and, and the IRFU as well, but so we're just waiting now on the Scottish Rugby Union, and, and, and I believe... Oh, we love Nicola. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we really have to look at... There's a lot of uh, good research going into uh, in, in Swans University and many universities where they are looking at uh, head injuries, uh, early onset dementia in women. I know. You know, and, and there's a lot of this work is going on out there. And I think it's a question of somebody said, you know, I did look on Twitter, shouldn't. Uh, you know, somebody said, oh, there's, a, there's nobody, there's, there's no trans women playing in, in, in rugby in Wales. And I'm going, hang on a minute. It doesn't matter. We we'll each have a category. We need to have a category. I played rugby the other day. I played a veterans over 35s, should have been over 50, really. But. Um, <laughs> There is a place in sport for everybody. Yes, there is. We are not banning anybody from participating in sport. Absolutely. I have to say, if it, there's an open category or a category where you know you're not taking the testosterone, but you identify in another gender, that's absolutely fine. But let's let's not call us bigots. Let's not. We are not. We just there is a right place for everybody to play and participate in sport. It is great for well-being. We've really enjoyed the sport that we've played over the years. I don't want to see anybody excluded. I hate the word banned. It's play in true, your correct category according to your sex your age, your weight, yeah. all of these things, because safety and fairness matters. Yeah, absolutely. And 
and that is the whole point of sport. You know, sport has categories because it is exclusionary. So we have an under 12s race because we don't want 15 year olds in it. You know, that's why it's the under 12s. You know, we have a weight category because we don't have a heavyweight in with the bantam weight because that would be unfair. So they're not allowed to do it. That's the whole point of categories in sport. That's why the female category was invented. It's called women because way back then they didn't think people would be identifying as a different sex. So, but it does, it was created for the female of the race. And that is what is just so very frustrating, you know, is that nobody wants to ban anyone from sport. I have benefited, as we all have, as you said, Tom, from sport. Sport is amazing. It's so good for our mental health as well as our physical health. Really underestimated how important it is for our mental health. So the last thing we should be doing, the difficulty we had initially with all of this, you know, five, six years ago, was trying to get anyone to even come to the table and have a decent debate. You know, we couldn't even get people to sit down around a table for us to be able to talk the science before we were called names. You know, and I had people ringing every single company I worked for, trans activists ringing my company, ringing the BBC, ringing everybody to say that I was a transphobe. I have no issue with anyone identifying however they would like. However, it doesn't change your biological sex. One point I want to add is you quite often hear people saying, at elite level or at international level or at an otherwise defined high level, yes, it must be females only, but lower down we can be more inclusive. I've heard this from three men who are very closely involved in athletics. Two are two of the best coaches in the world. The other is heavily involved in an NGB. And I completely reject this because for two reasons. One is you're effectively saying Good sports women deserve fairness. Not very good sports women don't deserve fairness. This is completely wrong. Females of all ages and abilities deserve fair and safe competition. Yeah. The second reason... The, the second reason is if you allow males into women's sport at recreational or lower down levels, you break what's called the development pathway up to elite level. So, you know, yeah. I, was, I was a recreational grassroots level athlete for 20 plus years before I became semi-elite elite. So we won't have female elite athletes in the future if males are allowed into the female category at lower levels. Thank you. Do you want to say something? No, only, only to echo the same thing. You know, it's ridiculous to say that, that we're going to protect elite athletes and we're not going to protect the pathway. How on earth does someone become elite if they don't start at the bottom and work their way up? That's just, just stupid. Can I just take this opportunity to thank you all, Philia? Give yourselves a big round of applause. But I'd also like to thank Sharon Davis and Mario Mucci for being absolute total legends and I look forward to sharing a platform with you again. Now we're going to hear from two women who are elite athletes in the Masters category and also professional in sport in a different way. So Dr. Kerry McGauley is a lecturer and researcher in sports science at Mid Sweden University. She's an international Masters triathlete and a mad time trial cyclist and swimmer and does all kinds of crazy things. Um, and Victoria Hood, some of you may have heard from before, she is a, also um, a former international master cyclist and she now runs a women's professional cycling team called Jaden, uh, Team Jaden Vive Lavello. And you might remember she, three years ago in London, in the QE2 conference center where LGB Alliance hosts their conferences, we, Women's Place UK and, and Fair Play for Women hosted a big meeting um, of sports women and Victoria came and, and Sharon came and spoke then and that's when she broke cover really and she'll tell you a bit about that. Um, her professional cycling team, Team Jaden, you can find them on Instagram, they're raising money right now to keep going. Um, uh, so just thought I'd mention that. So well, let's start, I've asked Victoria to just get, to take a few minutes to tell us her story and tell us about her experiences in sport. Hi everyone, so yeah it's great to be here. Um, Jade and Vive Lavella are one of the longest standing teams in the UK and we've been around now for about 10 years. I've previously spoken at Women's Place, as Fiona just mentioned, about setting up the team and all of those battles that I encountered being a woman in such a male-dominated sport. You can watch that online, so I won't go over it too much, but I'll just give you a brief background. So, 
when I first came into the sport, there was no progression for women. In fact, there was hardly any racing for women, let alone progression. The few women that did come into the sport, they had to either race in with the men or against elite women. Men had categories designed to progress them through the ranks from novice to elite. For women, there were no categories. You had complete beginners racing in with world champions. This was an issue I fought for, and after a lot of hard work, we now have categories for women, and we have women's racing separate from the men. The situation was just as bad for junior girls. We lose so many of our talented girls. When a youth boy moves up to junior category, he has a full series of races to aim for. These include really prestigious races. Um, they're really well known for developing the next generation of cyclists. They also have their own junior national championships. The girls had nothing. They could either choose to race in with the junior boys, which they would never do, because once these boys have developed, they'd be way out of their depth. Um, or they could move straight into the elite women's category. There was no support, there was no funding. They would have to do this alone, and they would have to travel to races around the country to race against the UK's best women. They'd gone from doing 30-minute races on closed circuits to open road races of 60 miles plus. There was no progression. It was all or nothing. Yeah. We battled, we battled for that, and in 2017, we finally got a junior women's championship. Thank you. The junior scene is growing, but there are still lots of barriers to teenage girls competing. When I started the team, around 2009, there were 305 youth girls aged 13 to 15 with racing licenses. But at junior, only 67. 10 years later, there were 852 youth girls racing, but still only 235 juniors. So it is increasing, but it still shows you the barriers that girls are you know, facing, and they're not continuing in sport once they reach 16. Female domestic racers often have to hold down full-time jobs as well as trying to fit in their training and racing. To, to give an example, in my team, nearly all of the girls have jobs, but they still compete at elite level. All of the staff, helpers, that we can find, they all fund themselves just through the love of the sport. Running the team, which is almost a full-time job in itself, has to be done on top of all of our full-time jobs. This is a huge difference to the men's side. They have staff, they have tour buses, they have a wage. My role as manager, director sportif, as it would be known in cycling, is a fully paid full-time job on the men's side. To give you an idea, I'll tell you about the tour series. Throughout the month of May, we have a series of races in city centres which are televised twice weekly on ITV. It's fantastic racing, it's a great showcase and an opportunity to get all of our teams and sponsors out there on TV, but it's a logistical nightmare. There are two to three races per week, most of which are weekdays. They're in cities that span the UK from London one day to Edinburgh the next. The men's teams have funding to move around from race to race. They have team buses, they have accommodation. Women's teams are dealing with taking the day off work or university, driving four hours to race a 45 minute race and then having to get back to be at work the next morning. We would love to be able to pay the women out of work for a month and travel them around, but this is just not reality for women. I would love to be able to pay my girls a wage, but to be honest, just expenses would be nice. In my role as manager, I've always been completely in a man's world. For a number of years, I was the only female in the manager's meetings, especially at elite and UCI level. I was the only female driving a car in the convoy. I had no training for this, and the men who worked for other teams weren't exactly forthcoming with words of encouragement. In fact, it was pretty standard for them to just look me up and down, or just blatantly laugh at me. I once walked into a manager's briefing to be asked whether I was lost by the full of men. Cycling is still a male-dominated sport. Sometimes it feels I'm just banging my head against a brick wall, but I am optimistic about the future of women's cycling. We need coverage, we need more support at all levels, and we need you to watch. 
Women's racing is exciting. It's not controlled by big teams, so it's more dynamic, attacking. We also need to keep speaking out. We need to keep pushing for equality. We're extremely grateful for the few sponsors that we have, and we work as professionally as we can, punching way above our weight on such a limited budget and optimistically waiting for the day we don't have to worry quite so much. So much in cycling needs to change, but together, women's voices are starting to be heard. For the domestic scene in 2022, for the first time ever, we had the tour series line up the women as the main event. The message this sends out is paramount in gaining equality. We are no longer the warm-up act. On a more practical note, it also crucially gives the women who are still holding down full-time jobs more time to get to the race, so we're thankful for that. On the international scene, we had the return of the women's Tour de France. If girls cannot see, they cannot be. And we can only hope that this coverage will lead to more support, more funding and sponsorship for women's cycling at all levels. And young girls all over the world can one day dream of riding the Tour de France. Thanks, Victoria. Now, I mentioned earlier, you first spoke out at the World Masters Champion, after our event, the World Masters Champ Cycling Championships came to Manchester and a certain uh, Dr. Rachel McKinnon, as they was then known, um, raced there. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Manchester was my first time of speaking out and it was such a bizarre situation. I didn't speak to one competitor or official that agreed with McKinnon racing, but nobody would say anything. Everything was so hush-hush. You could tell there was, everybody was really nervous about it. The climate was different back then as well, wasn't it? Um, you only had to mention trans women to be accused of transphobia. It was at a point where if you didn't smile correctly on the podium next to McKinnon, you'd risk losing your sponsorship. I said I'd be interviewed and Fair Play for Women were fantastic at supporting me throughout that. But, you know, I still did worry. I knew I'd have to defend myself. But I thought about it and, it, and in the end, I know, I know myself. I know I'm not transphobic. I'm just speaking out for what is fair. So... <laughs> Sky asked to interview me and it caused quite a stare in the velodrome. The British cycling staff followed us everywhere. They listened to everything we were saying. They were really on edge. I think... If they could have stopped me doing the interview, they would have. They actually asked me to go off and do the interview in a small side room, away from everybody so nobody could hear. I thought, that's just playing into their hands. That's what they want. They want us to be afraid to speak. So I thought, no. I went to Sky and I said, we're going to do this interview smack bang in the middle of the velodrome in front of everyone. <laughs> and that's what we did. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, in fact, I think we even set up in front of McKinnon's warm-up area. <laughs> but, you know, I hope it just gave others the courage to speak out as well. You know, and, and can I just say as well, I watched McKinnon in the final of the sprint. And let, let's just get one thing clear, McKinnon is not a good cyclist. <laughs> it's just true. You know, there's no skill, there's no tactics. Um, all they had to do was wait at the bottom of the track and just put the power down, which is what happened. And it was actually quite shocking. You know, I, I knew I was going to be upset watching it, but it was shocking to see them just move away from a really skillful, strong female competitor. The GB girls came out to watch that final. And afterwards, one of them literally ran to me and was just panicked and just said... I can't believe what I've just seen. What, what can we do? I, I, this cannot be happening. She said, I want to say something, but I'll be kicked off the squad. Yeah, and that takes us to then the next big thing. So yeah. then, that was master cycling. Then we had Emily Bridges, who tried to get selected for the Welsh women's cycling team and may well come back and do so. Um, how did people in cycling feel about that? Do you know, the whole thing was a farce, wasn't it? Um, the UCI and British Cycling, 
they had a chance to do the right thing there and they just failed. They failed women, they failed the sport. Bridges was going to be a huge scandal for them. There was talk of a boycott and the cycling community was in uproar. You know, you've got to realise as well, it's really difficult for these girls because a lot of my girls grew up with Zach. They're friends with Zach. You know, they've raced with Zach. And so now they're friends with Emily. And they know it's not right. They know it's not fair. But, you know, but they shouldn't be in a position where they have to be speaking out against this, you know, against their friends. <laughs> British Cycling have just shut it down. They won't take any calls. They won't answer any emails on it. They point blank refuse to listen to any members at all. Obviously, the UCI then stepped in and they stopped Bridges competing on a technicality. But this has left a lot of bad feeling and because nobody knows. Nobody knows where they stand. BC withdrew their trans policy, um, but there's still trans women competing as we speak. You know, it, it's not good for women, it's not good for cycling, and it's not good for trans people who just don't know where they stand with, with all of this. We really thought that the UCI was going to finally do the right thing. And when they backtracked and just lowered testosterone levels, honestly, it was a complete slap in the face of all women. One of the main problems at the UCI is Katerina Nash. After all of these years of men making decisions for women at the UCI, we now have Katerina who conveniently is also absolutely on board with full inclusion of trans women in the female category. She holds this view for whatever reason, I cannot even begin to understand against all the science, against all the fact. There are numerous women's groups fighting this and they are pushing so hard to have a voice at the UCI, but they are just reaching a complete block and we believe that Katerina plays a huge part in that. Austin Killips is a trans woman competing very successfully in the US at the moment. They've been racing for one year and they're already pro. Austin is coming to Europe. Austin wants to ride the Tour de France and it looks like they will be doing. Clear policy needs to come now. Nobody is saying that trans can't compete. Compete in your biological sex or fly the flag for the trans community and create a separate category, just as we had to do for women. Okay. Thanks, Victoria. So um, let's come to Kerry now. So we heard a lot about um, sexism in cycling. Um, tell us about your experiences as a woman in sport. I feel like an imposter in the room. Uh, well, tell, <laughs> tell us about your football, Kerry. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of new to this environment. When I grew up, I was a soccer player as a little girl. Um, I didn't feel that I was experiencing any sexism whatsoever. I played with my brother in the garden, with my uncle. I played with all the boys in the playground. And they were fine about it and very inclusive of me playing football. I played for a girls' team. I thought I had everything until probably even a few years ago that I even in my 40s started to think about this a little bit more because it was it is still so normalized uh, and Sharon mentioned about the difference between men's and women's football but um, it wasn't odd to me at all that I was playing in the women's national premier league in the UK also in Australia um, that I was paying subs, that I was paying to go around the entire country uh, to do my hobby um, at the very highest level that there was. Um, and the boys that I'd played football in in the playground that were relatively nowhere near as good as me in their sex category were playing semi-pro for a little local team and getting 50 quid in their pocket to go up the pub with. Um, so... I didn't think anything of it at that time. I, I don't feel like I've experienced sexism throughout my lifetime. Um, I'm in a very male-dominated world, uh, in a world of elite sport, in my job. Um, but, as I said at the beginning, it's only recently when you start to realise that, hang on a minute, this 
why is it normalized that we are so far down in terms of being second rate? Yeah, so we've still got a hell of a battle, and here we are with people coming and trying to take from us the little that we've got. Now, one thing you mentioned to me recently, where people think sports become much more equal and improved a lot, but you had a recent experience with a time trial record. Tell us about that. Yeah, and I mean, um, Victoria's just brought up so many great examples from cycling and made it very, very clear, the picture very clear. But I mean, I race uh, time trialing, for example, and, and it's an individual sport. You race against the clock, and it's not strange to include men and women in the same start fields uh, because you go off at intervals like a minute apart. Um, but the results lists are also combined. So I will win the race, and I will feature somewhere halfway-ish down with, for want of a better phrase, the very, very average men. <laughs> um, and I just set a course record, for example, at one of our local courses. And again, you will get no recognition for that. There's no acknowledgement. You're just another name. My name is actually a boy's name as well. So you wouldn't even know that it was a woman. So you basically have zero recognition for your feats, your achievements. And then uh, the Cycling Time Trial Association wonders why no women race in time trials or at a local level, at a grassroots level, who want to aspire to this because what are they aspiring to? There are no role models or very, very few. And, and it's, it's laughable. Like, they're, they're scratching their heads. Yeah. So they talk Where about... Where the women? They talk about wanting to grow female participation and then they wonder why. Now, one challenge to that, of course, is that a lot of the coaches and organisers, not you, but a lot are male... And you told me about um, that question coming up on a panel recently where an elite male coach was being asked what could be done to get more women into coaching and providing role models. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I work in sport. I'm a sports scientist. A couple of weeks ago, we had a big uh, winter sports conference. Um, I work with the Swedish cross-country ski and biathlon teams. Um, and yeah, it was a conference where... Um, some of the male coaches were sitting on a panel with also some of the women and, and he was kind of asked directly, yeah, what, what can we do to, 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 to increase the, the, the number of women uh, coaching at an elite level? And the guy was literally stumped. He firstly didn't, hadn't even realised that I think that there was kind of low uh, representation of female uh, coaches at that kind of level but it was almost like well why is that even relevant why is it necessary why is it interesting what's the point what's the problem and and, and one thing that I was thinking about on this is that um, equal opportunities ha have become it, it, it's so at the forefront that that you're not you know it's it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of sex uh, in terms of giving jobs or opportunities um, so equal opportunities have been rammed down our throat and and that has grown massively, but it's not only about opportunity because women are actually not attracted to these roles because how exhausting is it, how much of a fight is it to be a woman, to be the only female coach in a ridiculously male-dominated arena? You feel like an imposter. You're actually not treated with any sort of respect. You don't, you're not, and, and now there's research literature on this as well. There's papers coming out to kind of prove this point or give a lot more evidence to this point that um, young people will also look at female coaches and not see them as being competent whatsoever in their profession. So um, th there's so many more challenges besides just the opportunity itself because we're not comfortable even if we do have that opportunity yeah. in that environment. So let's talk a little about younger women. So, um, you know, a lot of the younger women in, in sport that I talk to think that we have to be kind and inclusive. And it honestly seems like some of them have no idea that the male performance advantage could wipe them out. Now, I know you teach physiology in sport to students, male and female. What's the response of the women to that? Well, the response of the women is quite similar to the response of the, the, the men or the, the female and the male students I have. I, I, I don't discriminate between them, but the, the issue is a complete lack of knowledge. And that comes from a complete lack of education. So I teach mostly on postgraduate courses at a master's level and I supervise PhD students and so on. Um, but I've spent a lot of time working 
on, on bachelor level degree programs as well. Now, there is, I don't know of any programs that teach sports science, which is a hugely popular uh, program in the UK particularly, that actually highlight any sex differences whatsoever, that highlight any women's specific needs. We usually feature in a textbook under a special population. Tr tr true story, yeah. So you'll read about all of the cardiovascular um, adaptations to training, the respiratory adaptations to training, et cetera, et cetera, the hormonal adaptations. Everything is based on men. All the data is based on men. All of the examples in the textbooks are picture, pictures of men. Um, and then women pop up as a sort of special population, as a bunch of people that menstruate. Um, and, and maybe we should consider that in some way, but we're not too sure how. Um, so, so the problem is I get these students who are at a very high level working in elite sport um, and they read this master's program at the same time as having a professional job in elite sport, um, oftentimes coaches, um, and they've had no education whatsoever. So it's not until I start teaching them that actually in endurance sport, for example, there's a 10 to 15% difference in capacity or performance between men and women, that in high power sports, it's, it's much bigger than that actually. And they haven't considered this as, and, and more importantly, they haven't considered the consequences of this. So I've got a classic lecture now where I show them pictures of McKinnon, for example, Hubbard, uh, and I say, is, is this a problem? And they're all being kind. No, this is great. Let's include everybody. And then I have a physiology lecture about what's going on in our bodies through puberty, as we've already touched upon, and so on and so on. And I, and I pose the same question at the end, and they're, they're in a shock at themselves. <laughs> Thanks. So my point on that is education, educate, 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 because these people don't actually know. These are great students, they're great people, and they want the best, but they literally do not have the information. So they need to get that information. Yeah. Now, speaking... Absolutely. One more question, Kerry. Um, so meanwhile, there are, of course, studies going on in British universities about transgender athletes trying to prove that it can be made fair for males to compete in women's sport. Um, tell us a little bit. I know you tried to find out a bit about that. Tell us about that. Yeah, because it actually came when I read the Cycling Weekly um, uh, article about Emily Bridges, and there was, um, I, I could read about the Joanna Harper studies and that Emily Bridges was a participant. So this was all public knowledge in a, in a broad like magazine, a, a popular magazine. So I was reading all this information, and even some of her his, they, theirs, <laughs> told you I'm an imposter. Um, test data basically was reported in this article. And I thought, well, that's a bit odd because I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher in this field and your participants are not allowed to know their test data till the end of the experiment, which as far as I understood was ongoing. So that seemed odd. And I also was questioning, well, how are they possibly setting this experiment up to be able to uh, rigorously test their hypothesis? Um, so I sent an email to uh, basically one of Johanna, Johanna Harper's um, supervisors who would be kind of on a peer level to me. Um, I know of him and I just kind of kindly, politely asked, I'd be really interested to know about your research aims, hypotheses and methods to answer your questions, which actually is a very normal thing that we would often have to pre-record or um, pre-register the information about our research questions. And I got a very strange response that um, it was very inappropriate of me to try to draw information out about one of their studies. And ac according to participant confidentiality, he obviously couldn't um, give me any information about the data. I was like, it's already on Strava. It's already in Cycling Weekly. And, uh, and in the response, he also copied in two colleagues, the other two supervisors, if it was a kind of covering the back scenario, as if I was doing something very underhand and sceptical. So the whole thing was very odd and not at all how we would normally function in an intellectual world of, of sports science so research. Not, not like science. Basically not like <laughs> science. Yeah, so I think we know it's not science, don't we? Um, just, uh, if you Google my name and the critic, you will find I've written uh, a, a critique of the Joanna Harper approach to proving the validity of uh, transgender sport, which was really fun to write, actually, because there's so much wrong with it. Kerry and Victoria, thank you very much. Did you want to say something more, Kerry?
No, I just want to kind of, I guess, say that how important that I think this is for protecting girls and women in sport because sport has actually saved my life. It really has. That sounds a bit extreme, but it has. And it's also given me a life, and I'm sure it has for you and the people sitting around me as well. So this is super crucial to give a platform to the girls and women in the same way that we've had through our lives. And it's, it's just ridiculous that we're not actually spending our time taking women's and girls' sport forward and that we're fighting to scratch back where we have yeah, been absolutely. a long time ago. Yeah. But we are fighting. Thank you both. She's not an imposter, is she? No, no. So now we're going to focus in some depth at one particular sporting injustice for women that happened in the USA this year. You all know what I'm talking about. Um, how could a man be allowed to take a national championship in a women's event? I mean, we just couldn't have imagined, but here it is. So we're gonna find out what that was like. Um, and uh, I've got two guests. One of them is on video because um, the Wi-Fi, live Wi-Fi wasn't good enough to, to, um, to do it live. So we'll, we'll meet her in second. Um, the other one, you may remember when the story about Leah Thomas broke, there was one brave woman whose daughter had to race Leah Thomas, who spoke about it anonymously uh, and spoke about how the girls had all been told they weren't allowed to talk and all of that. Do you remember, who remembers Swim Mom? Yeah, so she was brave then, and she got braver. And now she's here. Uh, meet Kim Jones. I know. She's come here for this, for you. And she founded a new campaign group called ICONS, Independent Council on Women's Sports. So we'll hear from Kim in a minute. But first, um, we're going to hear from Riley Gaines, who was a student at the University of Kentucky, um, one of the best in America uh, as a swimmer in her event and she was, she found herself racing against Leah Thomas. Hi Riley, welcome to Philia. Hello, thank you guys so much for having me. I wish so badly that I could be there in person, but I guess Zoom will have to work. Okay, so I've explained to the audience here a little bit about who you are. What we really want to hear is about the last year in college and your swimming experience. Tell us about that. Um, it was about November through um, my senior year. November is about the middle of our season. In the beginning of that season, I had made it my goal to become a national champion in the 200 yard freestyle, which means the fastest collegiate swimmer in the country. Um, but in November of our senior year, I was ranked about third or fourth behind some amazing female athletes that I knew very well, um, because of course, your top athletes know your top athletes, regardless of which school you're at, where you're at in the country. Um, you just develop friendships with people who are at similar levels in terms of competition as you. And I think that's the same across all sports, you know, basketball players, your best basketball players know your best basketball players. And so I was very familiar with the girls who was ranked above me because we've competed against each other our whole lives. Um, but the person ranked first, I had never heard of. Um, extremely bizarre to me because I look at this name and it wasn't a freshman or someone who just came out of, you know, who just came from high school. This was someone who was a senior, which makes it even more bizarre. Um, and to add to all of that, this was a swimmer from University of Pennsylvania, which is not known for producing fast swimmers. And so all of these things, they just weren't really adding up. Um, but at this time, I had no idea that Leah Thomas was formerly Will Thomas. And so I thought to myself, you know, who is this person? And I asked my coaches, I talked with my teammates, and, you know, we kind of were just all baffled um, and confused by the situation at hand. But of course, I went back to training and focusing on myself and doing what I could do um, to help pursue my, my dreams and my goals. 
but a couple days after Leah Thomas posted the fastest times in the nation. An article was released disclosing that Leah Thomas was formerly Will Thomas and swam three years on the men's side at UPenn. And honestly, when I heard this information, I was kind of relieved because I thought to myself, you know, surely the NCAA will see how this is a swimmer who was ranked in the 500s, 600s just last year in the men's category as a male, but has now switched over to the females category and is the fastest female in the nation. I thought surely that would make sense to anyone who blatantly just looks at the facts and the, and the statistics, but that's not what we saw. And I was proven very wrong. Um, it was about two weeks or three weeks before our national championships and this past March when the NCAA finally released that they would allow Leah Thomas to compete in the female category. And how did you feel about that? Um, and so at first, you know, we were kind of like, what is this going to look like? But to be there on that pool deck that first day and watch Leah Thomas win a national title, um, beating out Olympians, American record holders, I mean, the fastest U.S. female swimmers for a national title, it just left you with this feeling of utter heartbreak because you know what it takes to get to that level as a female. The hours that you put in, starting from when you're five years old, um, and to have someone who hasn't even spent a full year as a female just blow you out of the water. It's just this feeling of like enragement, one that no one is sticking up for you and that no one is talking about the, how wrong this is. And two, you just feel like defeated before you even compete. Mm. And what was the mood around the, the, the pool deck among the other female competitors? Did you talk about it? Yeah, I, that first day, which is the day that Thomas won the national title, um, it was almost like people were walking on eggshells. Um, there was definitely grumbles of frustration and kind of whispers and chuckles and all of that, but people were cautious. No one really know, knew one who to talk to because no one had stuck up for us this far. You didn't know who to say anything to. Um, but that next day coming back after that night, we had seen Thomas win a national title. That's when the mood totally shifted. There was no more whispers and little chuckles. At this point, people were being vocally frustrated. Um, you know, you could hear it. You could see it among people's eyes and their facial expressions and their tears um, and the extreme discomfort in the locker room. It was at this point that, you know, people realized this is not okay and this is totally wrong. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the locker room. What is the locker room like at a swim meet? So at a swim meet, it is a place, one, where you're just totally vulnerable. Um, growing up a swimmer and making it to the NCAA championships, clearly you've spent your, your fair share of time in a locker room. And it's just not a place where there's any sort of reservation. Um, it's an extremely bubbly place. You get to see your friends from all over the country that you haven't seen in so long. And so there's so much chatter and laughter and all of the things. But of course, at a swim meet, you get there, you have to, you get there in your clothes, you have to undress your clothes to put your warm up suit on, um, which is just a typical bathing suit that you would probably think of. Um, you go warm up. But then after warm up, you have to go back to the locker room and put your fast, your fast suit on, which is the ones that are kind of knee length. And that takes about 15 minutes because they're skin tight. Um, it's this non stretchy material. So you're fully naked for about probably 15 minutes. Of course it varies, but it's a struggle. You're tugging and you're pulling and you're sweating and it's a whole experience in and of itself. Um, and then after you compete, you come back in the locker room, you change into a different suit to go warm down. And then after you warm down, you come back in the locker room, completely undress and put your clothes on. So obviously there's a lot of time spent in a locker room at a swim meet being totally naked and vulnerable. Um, and when we, first of all, we were not forewarned that we would be sharing a locker room with Thomas. Um, that was not something that was even remotely discussed. That was part of the reason why I initially mentioned it was kind of intriguing. All of myself and my teammates, we were so curious, like, you know, will Leah Thomas be in a locker room with us? Like, what kind of body parts does Leah Thomas have? Like, there were so many questions. Um, but that first day, 
we're in the locker room. It's super chattery. Um, everyone's really excited to see each other. And I have my back turned and all of a sudden the locker room gets dead silent. And so I'm like, whoa, weird. And I turn around and there is someone who is six foot four towering over everyone in the locker room. And it just got silent. And I just stood there and without even hesitation, you just feel like you need to cover. And it's, it's not something that's deeply embedded in transphobia or whatever stupid excuse you can make. It's the thought that you have someone with male parts in your locker room looking at you and exposing themselves. And the fact that no one was talking about it, no coaches, no parents, um, no one with political power. You just felt so helpless. Tell me about how you prepared, how you felt then getting ready for that race and then tell us about the race itself. You just feel like you're swimming with your hands behind your back. Um, and so that morning we qualified for finals, which means the top eight swimmers. And then you come back and swim again at night. And so we were a couple lanes apart at night. Um, we race, I touched the wall at the end. And before I even look at what place I got, I was more curious as to who won. And I look up and I see the number five by Leah's name. And so I was indicating that Leah had gotten fifth. And so I, I felt so much pride for the people who beat Thomas. Um, I truly was like, wow, you know, like they did the seemingly impossible, um, which of course there's speculation behind that of if Thomas was even trying, because if you know swimming and if you know splits and you look at that swim and that time, you can see that Thomas clearly let up. Um, but that's a different story. So then I look at my name after seeing what Thomas went. And I also see the number five and I kind of look back and forth and I look at my teammates for reassurance who were standing on the side of the deck and all of their jaws are just like dropped. And so it was at this point, I realized that we had tied, which is pretty rare to do in swimming, go the same time down to the hundredth of a second. Um, but we get out of the water and we go behind the awards podium where they distribute the trophies and the NCAA official looked at me and said, great job. Um, you know, we don't really account for ties. We only have one fifth place trophy. So we're going to give it to Leah. Um, yours will eventually come in the mail. And so I sit there and I was like, okay, I understand that there's only one trophy and you don't account for ties. But can I ask you why you're adamant on giving this trophy to Thomas? And he looked at me and said, oh, well, we're just doing it in chronological order. And I said, okay, <laughs> well, what are we being chronological about? Because we literally tied. And he said, well, for photo purposes, Thomas has to hold the trophy. You can pose with the sixth place trophy, but you'll have to give it back and yours will come in the mail. And so it was at this point that I realized what was happening. Um, you know, not only were we, we being forced to change in a locker room with men and compete against men, the female athletes at the female meet were being sidelined to men. And so it was at this point really that I was done waiting for someone else to stick up for us. Um, it had hit me that if we as female athletes weren't willing to stick up for ourselves, we couldn't expect other people to. This is something that had to come from us if we wanna change. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what I did. So someone else who did stick up for those girls was the mother of one of them. Kim, tell us how you got involved and what happened. So my daughter swims for Yale University and I found out early in the season, just looking through some of the first dual meets that there was a new swimmer in the Ivy League um, swimming some ridiculously fast times. There he is. Should I say something? Yeah. Oh. Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, so my daughter swims the same events uh, that Leah swims and I thought, I wonder how many people are aware of this. And I called my daughter up and she hadn't been aware of it. Um, most of the girls were unaware except at Penn. Uh, my first phone call after speaking with my daughter was to think, you know, someone's for sure gonna take care of this, much like uh, Riley was saying. We, I think all of us had been well, you all are so far ahead of us in the United States. <laughs> I literally had no idea that there was this movement going on. I didn't understand 
Um, I mean, I'd heard of, of transgender people, but I hadn't really spent much time thinking about it. Um, and I, of course, like everyone else, you don't want to be cruel. You want to be kind. You don't want to judge people for shoes that you're not walking in. Um, so I set it aside, thinking our women's rights were protected. You know, we had legal recourse. There was no way we were really in jeopardy. And I thought that people would step in and say, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, women's sports are reserved for women, and I'd heard of Laurel Hubbard, but again, I thought that disappeared from the news, so they must have done the right thing and taken care of it. Um, so my first phone call was actually to a friend of mine at the ACLU, where I thought, <laughs> and you all laugh. <laughs> I thought, you know, there's a whole women's rights division there. I know that there's a trans rights organization also, but they must be having conversations about this conflict of rights. And this was my introduction. That, that was a long conversation, but I left that conversation realizing that women were no longer a valid category in life. <laughs> it was... It was the single most transformative conversation I've ever had in my life, bar none. More transformative than finding out I was pregnant for the first time. <laughs> uh, more transformative than learning where babies come from. When I was like, I want out, I want no part of this. Um, so I think that when I hung up the phone from that conversation, learning that sex had already been erased from legal documentation in the state of California. The ACLU was working to make it not possible to use sex-based language in the court of law, um, that we were working on eradicating women's rights with anything that referred to gender not meaning sex. Um, I, I was stunned. I, didn't, I knew what was coming down the pipes then. I, could, I knew that we were going to face this entire season. No, but I felt like I was let in on a little secret that no one else knew. So all of the girls thought people were going to protect them. They thought, you know, we've installed coaches. We've installed athletic departments. We've installed the NCAA. We have litigation in the Office of Civil Rights that's supposed to protect women's rights. It was after that conversation that I knew none of that was going to happen. But I felt helpless and dark. Um, but I'm so grateful. The reason I came all the way here to speak was really to show my appreciation for those of you in the United Kingdom. Because my next step was to read J.K. Rowling's essay. to learn about Maya, to follow Jane Claire Jones and Julie Bindle online, <laughs> and to reach out to every single person I could think of that was, or I could see that was speaking up. So thank you, all of you, for being the voice of women and giving me the language to be able to explain to not only myself, to my daughters and all of their friends and all of my peers what was going on. So it's with gratitude, extreme gratitude, that I am here <laughs> to say thank you. So um, just, just so people understand the kind of profundity of what the US swimming authorities allowed to happen, Tell us about these people in this photograph. Yeah, so um, as you all, you've heard described, Leah, or Will, was against the men. There are thousands of young men and boys that can do what Leah is doing on testosterone suppression. So um, this is obviously the, the fam infamous picture after the 500 free on the first day. Those three women are our Tokyo Olympians six months prior. So Emma Wyant, they're all medalists. So these are the fastest women in the world. That's Emma Wyant from Florida, Erica Sullivan, and Brooke Forty. 
They are all national champions, record holders. They've competed internationally for the US and they were all in Tokyo just what, like the six months prior representing the US. And uh, yeah, Thomas beat them handily. Yeah. So um, I mentioned when I introduced you, Kim, that you were so fired up by all of this that you <laughs> found a buddy and, f and founded a new organization in the yes. US. And you and I have been working together since then. And we are part of an international consortium of sports organizations. How about you tell the audience a bit about ICONS and about the consortium? Sure. So I started and co-founded an organization in the US called ICONS. It's the Independent Council on Women's Sport. This came out of the brainchild of just relentless conversations that happened right after I under started understanding that women no longer had the ACLU, they no longer had the National Women's Law Center, the Women's Sports Foundation was advocating for males in, in women's sport. We essentially had no public funding, no government funding, no legal recourse in the United States. There was no one that was going to be backing the U.S. in the court of law, women, U.S. women in the court of law defending their sex-based rights. So I ended up, I want to also, while I'm here, give a huge shout out to Kara Dansky, so, um, and Women's Declaration. <laughs> Kara gave me hope, <laughs> and um, she is just one of the bravest, most well-spoken women I have come across in the U.S. on this issue. She gave me, or encouraged me to speak out. She said, Kim, people need to hear this story. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know if it's me. So she, um, she I spoke with her, I spoke with women at the Independent Women's Forum, um, anyone who would listen, politicians, uh, sportswomen, Nancy Hogshead Makar has been doing an amazing job in the United States, Donna De Verona, Martina, we connected with Martina Navratilova, just, yes really strong, brave women who will not be shut up. And what I realized is that there was no collective voice of female athletes for anything. We've had horrible situations for female athletes in the U.S. with, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Larry Nasser, but with, yep. Um, just the abuse and uh, silencing of our young female athletes, our mature female athletes, and we needed to have an organization that was going to have their backs, a place where uh, women could come if they were facing discrimination, abuse, harassment of any kind. Because what was missing when Leah Thomas came out of the woodwork was any place for women to go ask for help. There, it didn't exist. So that was, that's why we founded ICONS. Our goal is to elevate and empower female athletes and protect both the here and now of women's sports and the future of women's sports. And Fiona has been a wonderful partner in that. We are... <laughs> and as has been said, sports are for everyone, but we absolutely need a collective voice of female athletes to defend our interest in the protection of our girls and the future generation's opportunities. So working with you and the International Consortium, we're trying to leverage um, this network that we're building to advocate for the fair treatment. I wanna say one thing about this, I think was beautifully said in the last webinar we had. Um, so sports is the public arena of the difference in the sexes. It's also the public arena for the way women can expect to be treated. Sport is supposed to be fair. The premise of sport is fair competition. All of its integrity is based on fair competition. And if women can't be guaranteed fair competition in the one place where that is supposed to be non-negotiable, what hope do we have in the other arenas where women are less visible? <laughs> I need to give credit for that quote to Lauren Bondley. So she's the one that spoke that truth last week on our, our last month in our webinar and uh, go check it out. <laughs> she did a beautiful job. Thanks, Kim. So um, we've got about another just another few minutes, um, and uh, you know that we're fighting back. Let's talk about the fight back. 
Um, in the last year, I've spoken to about 40 governing bodies of sport in the UK, and some of them are changing, and many more of them are working on it. And um, I'll, write, I'll write about that when I get home after this, so you can get all that information there. But for now, um, I just want to say what you can do. So there are two things you can do. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, people, a lot of the resistance to this that we, or the objections that I hear from governing bodies is they say, oh, but it's only a couple. Or they say, oh, we don't have that problem in our sport. And it's not true. And we need to be able to tell them that one trans-identifying man in a women's category ruins it for so many women and girls. And so we need to hear your stories. And thank you to the people who posted a few lines in the, in the Hoover app. Please tell us more. It could be anonymous. Don't have to name any names. We don't name trans athletes particularly. We don't care about them. It's the rules we care about and protecting the women's category. So tell us your stories. And secondly, tell someone else. Tell someone else. On our website, there are sample emails you can send. Tell your MP it's not okay. Tell someone in your local sports club. Speak to the school or to the um, local um, authorities who look after the, the, the leisure centers. But just tell somebody because what we find is when you tell somebody, they usually agree. And yet, it's the sports bodies who sometimes will say to me, our members don't mind because they've not heard. That's because they don't ask them. Because they don't ask them. That's right, Sharon. So tell somebody. Um, and, and the place to look is under the resources tab, take action, and there's stuff there. Okay, so um, what should you take out of this session? Um, they thought we wouldn't mind. They thought we'd be kind and just suck it up. And they're wrong. And we are pushing back. And as, as Kim said, and as Lauren said, sport is the public arena where we see the differences between men and women. But you know, as you heard from Riley, in sport you also have changing rooms, you also have women's boundaries, women's rights to speak about themselves, just being erased. So it's a microcosm of everything that is happening to us, and, and that's, that's one reason why it matters. Okay, I'm going to um, ask the panel, just quickly, if any of them want to say one last thing, and then we'll wrap up, so. We have to educate. Education in this is really, really key. There's a lot of misunderstanding out there. A lot of people just haven't thought it through. Uh, I'm gonna do a very quick ex education experiment. Keep your hand down if you feel confident that you know exactly what the rules on DSDs are in athletics. Everybody else put your hand up, if you don't know. Okay, so, great. This is different from the trans issue, uh, but essentially the characteristics of the DSD, the, the, the athletes to whom the DSD rules apply are male. Lots of people don't understand this, so this is an example of how you can educate. Same on testosterone which is banned by the WADA code in all circumstances. You might read in, on Twitter that trans-identifying females can, who are on testosterone can compete in the male category. It's not true. They might have a TUE, but pr fundamentally, testosterone is banned in all circumstances. So these are just two examples of education which, which, which could be useful. So please, as Fiona said, talk to somebody Talk to your child's school, sports club, your friends, colleagues. Just get this conversation going, and most people will agree with you. Um, just the same, really, as Mara. Just educate friends and family. I think also put pressure on the governing bodies. Um, one of the reasons why FINA were able to, to be so wonderfully transparent, they asked their athletes, they were the first association after five years to ask a single female athlete how she felt about losing her medals and her places. The coaches, 22,000 of them, stood up for their athletes and petitioned FINA as well to speak to coaches, speak to, because they all generally believe that fair, sport should be fair. That's the premise of sport, you know. People involved in sport, in real sport, want fair sport. Um, and just for you to understand how unfair this situation was, if I was to race at the NC2As in America 
in Leah's race with the testosterone in my body that Leah had in that race on that day, I would receive a four-year ban. <laughs> That's how utterly ridiculous it is. I just want to say that if you are Welsh and you live in Wales, please meet your member of the Senate, ask for a meeting, go to a surgery, speak to them about it, educate them. If you've got an MP that you'd like to meet, go and meet them, because I've got uh, constituents that are here this weekend, and they have helped me along the journey, and I think the more we talk, the more we educate, the more we discuss what the consequences are, how does it work, what happens if. And then when people think about that, that's when they'll get on board and peel that onion skin away and you get to the bottom. It's just not fair and it's just not right. Yeah, I mean, not, not too much to add. Uh, the facts don't lie, science never lies. That's why I'm a scientist. But um, <laughs> one thing I was thinking of is that, you know, maybe not the people in this room, but a lot of people have a real hard time speaking up. So we do need to encourage and teach and help people to know how they can talk about this and feel comfortable and secure um, speaking up and defending girls and women. Yeah, I think just the same really, education, raising awareness all the time, speaking out, because this is going to be a huge issue for generations coming up. You know, girls are going to be surrounded with gender identity and with trans people and trans friends and, you know, isn't that what we've always said? You know, you need to speak out about this and know that it's just fair. It's not about being kind. You know, what about being kind for your own rights? protecting your rights as a girl. So I didn't, I didn't go into uh, the, what, the abuse that was heaped upon the girls with keeping them silent. Um, the Ivy League was just unbelievable. If I could undo sending my daughter to that school, I would. They, this, fight is more than, it's even bigger than fairness in sport. This is about helping our next generation and our current generation of girls and women find their voice. It's about the erosure, the erasure of women's boundaries and their ability to speak out. If you have the power to be a voice, be a voice, because we have got to teach the next generation of girls that they can say no. It's not just sport, we know that, right? This is why it matters. But I want to leave you with one good news story. So, um, this came from a social worker who had a client who was a, a young girl, teenage girl, who was saying she was trans. And after the European Football Championships and the success of the England women te women's team, this girl was so impressed by the lionesses that she asked for help to find a girls' football team. And then the penny dropped, and she said to her social worker, I don't have to dress up in girly clothes and do girly stuff to be a girl. Yeah. And the social worker said to her, no, just be you. And as they talked, the social worker told the girl that she herself used to be called a tomboy for liking football. And this girl said to her, nah, you was just a girl that liked football. And this girl, who thought she might be trans, isn't saying that anymore. She's not questioning whether she's a girl. She knows she is. And now, she wants to be a lioness. Thank you. And thank you to our panel.